but I am very happy to be here this morning, and I appreciate that we've, we moved it from noon to the morning, because I couldn't do it at noon. Our Minister of Defense is coming, and I had to be ready to receive him, and so that's why I wanted to have a chance, and I'm glad we were able to accommodate, so thank you for coming up at this early mo moment. And in speaking about the relationship between Colombia and the United States, I think there are two words that we can talk of, that we can always use, a long friendship. In fact, the U.S. was the first country to recognize Colombia's independence. And ever since then, we have worked together on many, many issues in cooperation. For example, the Alliance for Progress, we had a very distinguished and far-seeing president at that moment called Alberto Lleras Camargo, who was very active in the Pan American Union and also in the United Nations. And he saw the importance of the Alliance for Progress. So the first group of Peace Corps of 40 that left the U.S. went to Colombia. And I think all of these kind of uh, situations show how Colombia and the United States have worked together for many years. And it's not a matter of our governments. It's a matter, it goes beyond this. It's our states, it's our countries, it's our peoples, it's our values. And I think that's at the base and that's what we have to remember as we look at the way that we've been working ahead. And just most recently, as Nelson has said, you've been helping us in a very significant way with Plan Colombia. And I would say that the presentation we're going to see today shows how this is a very successful example of the U.S. helping a country to move ahead. In the year 2002, and for me it's painful to say it, but if I'm going to be intellectually honest, a lot of people were saying this is a country that is becoming a failed state. It's a country that's not able to control some of its areas. It's a country where the violence is taking over. It's a country where its economy, which has always been strong because we've been a very conservative uh, a country has, who's never defaulted, we've always paid back, we haven't, we've never had hyperinflation. It was collapsing in 98, we had a recession, the first recession after the depression. So it was a country that was facing extreme problems. And you will see today that we're a country full of optimism and we're making a change. And that has to do with strong leadership in Colombia, but it has to do with the support that we've been receiving from the U.S through Plan Colombia, it's a support that started with President Clinton, that's gone through Congress through all these years, and you will see that it's made a difference. And I would say that's what's behind that wonderful, wonderful rescue that I think we all still light up when we think about it, to have been able to get out. Yeah, I, but this is, to, this is to all of us, because we were able to get out the three Americans. That was very important. Ingrid Betancourt, but also the 11 soldiers who had been there for 10 years. And they all came out and their messages were fantastic. There was no anger, there was no bitterness. There's, let's think about the others, let's move ahead. Thank you to the Army, thank you to the President, thank you to the United States, thank you to the media. It was very, very moving and I think there's a lesson there. And one of the of the soldier said, let's get out on the 20th of July, which is Independence Day, and let's send a strong message. And that's what you saw on Sunday. I hope you saw the Washington Post yesterday. Those kind of manifestations went, of marches took place all over the country and in all the major cities in the world where there were Colombians. The message was one of free them now, immediately, and it, it was very, very moving. We had a meeting here at Lafayette Square. It was done also with songs. Our artists all uh, gave their free time and Jorge Celedon was here to celebrate with us. He plays Vallenatos. He's very popular among the Colombians, so we were very grateful that he took the time. So these, what's been happening right now shows what wonderful cooperation between two countries that are working towards similar uh, values have been able to achieve. So I am... Um, with that introduction, I'd like to move ahead, and I thought today then I would just show you what's happened in these last six years. Why are we feeling that this is a new Colombia and that we've gone into a virtuous circle after having been in a vicious circle? The vicious circle before was drugs fueled illegal groups, fueled violence, led to a decrease in our economy, and led to a de an increase in our poverty. This is a vicious circle. We've now been able to turn it around to Greater security is giving us new investment uh, security, new confidence, 
the Colombians and foreigners are investing, and we have a program in uh, place that is giving us the social programs we need. So you'll see that poverty is decreasing, and so we're now into a virtuous circle after having been in a vicious circle. Let's look at the uh, security issues, and there we see how we have been able with Plan Colombia, and the, the issue there, which uh, sometimes is, is difficult to understand, when people talk about Plan Colombia, they talk hard side, soft side. Hard side being helicopters, winged, uh, what they're called, uh, helicopters, the wings that are fixed, the wings that are rotaries, and, and it has to do with the gasoline, it has to do with maintenance, it has to do with the pilots, all this. This costs a lot of money, and that's been called the hard. And the soft, which is very necessary, has been in, uh, increasing our justice, putting in programs of alternative development so that people who are involved in drugs will have other alternatives. But in fact, it's one and the same because only with these airplanes have we been able to reach out in a country that's very rugged because when the Andes come into Colombia, it divides up in three. So we have mountains that go up and down in one third of our country, which we say sort of like the equivalent of California. And the other part of Colombia, which would be the equivalent of Texas, Half of it is jungle and half of it are savannas where there are very few people and that's why the guerrillas have been there. So this is a country that has always favored uh, plains because we don't have the adequate roads, where it's not a good country for trains, and in fact that's why Colombia had the first commercial airline after the United States in Latin America. It was called Scarta because planes are a good way to move in Colombia. So I would invite everybody to see the hard and the soft as being absolutely complementary and we need both to be able to take the services and to make sure that we get the kind of services we need. What are we finding now? That we have the lowest homicide rate in 20 years, lowest kidnapping rates in 20 years, we're talking about 20 years, the lowest number of terrorist attacks in 18 years and the lowest carjacking rates. Here these uh, graphs show us the numbers uh, you will see in the shaded part is the, what was happening before President Uribe, and then what has happened since 2002 when he came in. So there we see how homicides have gone down from 28,000 to 17,000. 17,000 still is a considerable number, but it is an incredible 40% decrease. Kidnappings have went down from 2,400 to 226. So there we have a 90% decrease. We need to get to zero, and this is a message we were sending on Sunday and we need to send. Homicide rates by cities have decreased because what you find is that when you look at the general homicide, it's concentrated much more on the outskirts where there are the problems, not in the major cities. So you find that cities such as Medellin, Cartagena, Bogota are safer than many Latin American cities and even some American cities. So that we've definitely made progress. We've made progress in fighting drugs. We have to remember that fighting drugs has to do with fi the financing that our illegal groups were going. So violence and drugs and corruption go all together. So in fighting drugs, one, we're addressing issues of health, of consumption, which are fundamental, but we're also addressing issues of democracy, of uh, maintaining institutions, of strengthening institutions. So it's important to see the fight against drugs in an integrated way and to see the effects in an integrated way. In an integrated way, we see, yes, that, hectare, hec uh, that hectares of coca crops have decreased, probably not as much as we would have liked, but what the data will be showing, I would imagine, and here I'm speculating, but I understand that it'll be similar to the United Nations data. The hectares per se have not gone down so much. What's gone down is the productivity because we have plants that have been pulled out. We've increased the number of plants that we are manually eradicating. So we're talking about small plants that don't have the same kind of production, or we're talking about plants that were sprayed that don't have the same kind of uh, production. So we're finding less production, and this will be uh, in my next graph. I'll show you how that's reflected in the price here. The number of laboratories we've destro destroyed, but what's important is the number of traffickers and uh, the mafias that we've destroyed. That's what we need to do because by destroying them that you destroy the whole structure. And there's where these interdictions and the extraditions, we have extradited more than 700 people to the United States and the 17 most important leaders were extradited just recently. 
And so, oh, something happened here. No, I, oh, this graph didn't, okay. This graph didn't work very well. Oh, it just takes time? I'm sorry. Do I have to give it time? No. Uh, okay, okay, this shows how the price, uh, this is very, this is very sophisticated. This is too sophisticated <laughs> for me. Okay, and so here what you see is how U.S. cocaine purchase prices have gone up. And um, the next one will show how, I guess it works, ah, uh, no. It works the same way. This shows how the purity has gone down. So this way, we, in the, the end result of what's happening in the drugs, uh, you can now see in the U.S. marketplace. The, what we're finding is then, as a result, by taking away the financing of these groups, we're starting to win our battle against the FARC, against the ELN. You can see that we've been able, in the last year, the head, Madulanda, died, but four of the main first-tier uh, leaders were, one was killed, one was killed by his people, another one gave herself up, and another one was, uh, wa was, was killed in, in the fights. So we're finding that the FARC are being fractured. We're hearing from them that they not have good communications. We're hearing from the, those who've been rescued that the kinds of living conditions, food, et cetera, have deteriorated, that they don't have the same amount of ammunition. So we're definitely making very important inroads. And I think in Colombia at one point, we really wondered when will we ever be able to beat them? Because this was a group that was oblivious to everything because it was financed. So it didn't have to hear to, uh, from any other country. It didn't depend on anybody for financing. It was absolutely, self-contained, and so we, that's why we had to fight in Colombia, but at the same time, offer the possibility of peace. And now it has been on the table from the very beginning. President Uribe has said from the very beginning, I will fight you, I will regain the territory, I will take the services, but you can also make peace. And though that's the process that we started by defining a new law, which is very important because we had had peace process before, as have other places in the world but they're all based on amnesty and pardon. A leader who hands himself in in a peace process was always pardoned and received amnesty. In Colombia, because of the kind of violence we had, the kind of massacres that had occurred, because we needed to provide uh, support to the victims, we needed to address this issue much more responsibly, the leaders accepted that even if they gave themselves in, which is what they all did, they would have to be tried they're being tried. They will receive lower sentences if they comply with four different conditions. One, hand over all their structure, all their men, come in with all their men, and that's why we find that among the paramilitaries they came in with 40,000 men. If they stop the drug trafficking, if we find that they're drug trafficking again, they lose any of the advantages of the peace and law. They need to hand over those lands and those things, the whatever they got through force. And they also have to, so uh, the kidnappees, the, the drugs, their people, and the, and the illegally begotten uh, goods that they have. If any of these, they, we find that they're not fulfilling, they lose all of their, of, of the possibilities of acceding to the peace and, and, and justice law. But we've also sent out this message for individual cases. And the demobilized individuals here, you see these are guerrillas who have demobilized individually. One could also call it they've deserted the FARC, but they've deserted to a, a legal structure to a country which is saying, if you desert, we will receive you. We will give you, as we are giving all the other 30,000, a subsidy so that you can go back to school, be it to get your high school or to get technical training, to get an education, and you will have psychological support. The problem with any peace process where you've had people out in arms is the recidivism. People know how to earn their life and how to make their statement with their arms. We need them to learn how to come back to uh, the democracy and how to earn an honest living. And this is a big challenge. We're working on it. We still have problems. There is recidivism. 
we hope that it's half of what it's been in other places. We're told that in El Salvador and some of the Central American countries, 20% was the recidivism there was. We're finding about an 8 to 10%. But over 40,000 40, people, well, 8 to 10% is 4,000 people. And that's what you hear about these Aguilas Negras, which are groups that are going back to drug trafficking. Because you have to remember that even as we are moving ahead, we still have that incredible challenge, which is to continue to fight the drugs. So we're making peace in an environment which can be tempting for somebody to go back to the drug trafficking. So that makes it challenging, but we're aware of it and we're trying to work very strong on that. As a result of having greater security, we're finding in an economics that we have the highest flows of foreign direct investment to date. Exports have increased by 2.5 times. Inflation rate is one of the lowest in 42 years. Interest rates have remained low and stable. And we have a massive entrance. We would like to have a massive entrance. We now have more than 1 million people coming into Colombia. And we were told that Disney World is going to have their cruise go. So Mickey Mouse is going to go to Colombia this year with Donald Duck and Goofy. So uh, we invite you to come uh, and see us in Colombia with them. These are the specific data, and here you can see if you look at the GDP or you look at the exports or you look at the imports, between 1999 and 2007, there's an increase or either it's been doubled or tripled. And these are the specific uh, data that this uh, presentation will be on our web page, and it's available to any of you if, you if you want to see it. Here, I think this is a very interesting uh, graph, to, which shows that as, violent, as decreases, the economy goes, uh, increases. So you have a totally inverse relationship. As we had very high violence, our economy went into that recession. Once we've addressed the issue of violence, our economy is taking off. And that leads also to investor confidence. The growing economy is confidence of Colombians, but it's also a confidence of foreign direct investment. And in the last three years, you will see we've had more than Six million, six billion dollars uh, in 2005. A Saab Miller investment of 4.7 made it very, very high. But last year we almost reached the same level with more diverse investments. Exports have been increasing, and you can see that both traditional and non-traditional has been increasing. The inflation rate has gone down from 17 to 5.6. We hope to stay there. And interest rates have also m remained low and stable. And here is where you see that we've now reached the one million um, level of visitors. We hope it will be more. The Colombia lost 20 years. This was the level we had in the 80s, before the drugs and before that violence. Drugs have hurt Colombia very, very much. It's pushed us back in many ways. And this is one, as there's greater stability and we have this now uh, peaceful areas, you will now see that Colombia becomes very attractive for ecotourism. It's a country that has the greatest biodiversity, and I think it, is, it becomes very, very interesting and attractive. It's also a country that's making efforts to improve the business environment. Last year we received a pres this year we received a prize for being one of the seven countries in the world, according to the World Bank doing business study, that has made the most changes to make the in business environment the best. And what does this mean? This means that our social indicators have also improved. If you look at Latin America, the years, the 80s were considered the lost decade in Latin America, and, but for Colombia they were not. In the 90s, Colombia, because of the violence, lost everything it had gained in the 80s. So we were at the beginning, we were, when we started in the year 2000, we're back at the 80s levels. And so our poverty had increased, and we find now that between 202 and 207, poverty has fallen by 13 percentage points. Unemployment is finally reaching a one-digit level after 12 years. And we have more investment on corporate social responsibility and greater investment of the greater resources and investment in different social programs. So here we see another example of sort of, incre of inverse relationships. As the economy grows, um, the poverty rate uh, decreases. And uh, here you find that when we had an economy that wasn't growing, our poverty rate uh, increased. So here we see how our national poverty rate has decreased 
from fifty seven point five to forty four we still have an important way to go but we're going in the right direction as is a Gini coefficient which is still way too high Latin America has that problem our countries have very um, unequal distribution of wealth and this has to be part of the policies that we have here we see how our unemployment rate has gone down and here are some of the indicators of the efforts that President Uribe has made to increase coverage in social security, in social programs, and in education. We consider both of them health, social security, and education as fundamental. Uh, we're working very much on microfinance banking and with the Banco de Oportunidades reaching out to most of the country. What you see that is out in the shade here, this is where, here you can see very clearly how Colombia's population is distributed. Here's where the Andes goes, and so this is the more uh, healthier sort of land, and that's why all the population is sort of concentrated there. All this is Amazon, and all these are savannas. And this is part, this part which we call, which would be sort of the equivalent in size of Texas, is where it's very, very uninhabited. It's very, very low density. And um, so we're, this shows how we're reaching out to those places where we have population with microfinance programs. Uh, here's some more data on uh, corporate social responsibility. But I just wanted to share we're now reaching a 98% uh, education coverage. We uh, adopted a program, and I think there's where Latin Americans have to, a lot to learn from one another. Brazil had a program called Bolsa Escola, where they gave subsidies to the families to send the children to school. We picked up on that experience since 2002, and we have been increasing it, and we hope to have five million children in that program. But what we have been doing then is adding a little bit more to it. So not only must they keep the children in school, they must make sure that they get the vaccinations that they should. And we are also going into the schools with nutrition programs to make sure that the children are receiving breakfast and lunch so that these are children that can grow to their full potential and these are children that are awake and able to learn. If you're hungry, if you're malnut with malnutrition, you can't. Medellin is doing something fantastic. They're not only giving them food uh, the five days a week, they're giving them food Saturday and Sunday. The children go into school and they can get food because they're finding that on Monday morning the children were tired, they weren't paying attention because they hadn't gotten the adequate food that they needed over the weekends. So what do we find that um, we have also been doing in the area of labor? There's been, there is concern about what has been happening with our labor, and I wanted to share with you some of the major changes that we have made to address the issue of labor. We have increased our resources of government uh, to, to provide protection for union members, which whose situation has improved, fortunately, as the situation for all of the calamities have improved, but we'll see the data later on. And so we will find that the homicide rates of union members has gone down by 87% as compared to the 40% for the population in general. In all these cases, we need to improve. This is not a justification at all, and please never understand it as that. What we're trying, though, to see are the trends, and I think that's what is important at this moment. The average time we've worked on making structural changes, and I think what's important when we look at labor and when we look at what's happening in Colombia, these aren't just momentary decisions. They have to do with basic structural, structural changes. And in response, for example, because fighting the violence, decreasing the violence for the general population and specific populations such as labor is part of what Colombia needs and is doing. It was a campaign program the president defined, and we've been working in different ways. Every one of our governments have been trying to work in that way, so we have to understand it as a commitment the country has with itself. The same with justice. Our justice system was just had overflowed. With 33,000 homicides a year, our justice system, which on top of that was a written system that came from the Napoleonic uh, laws, the Napoleonic Code, uh, was a very slow system. We were absolutely overwhelmed, so President Uribe also, since 202, wanted a structural change. We made a constitutional change, and we've now gone to the accusatory system, which is the one you have in your country here. So you have two people doing, you have the attorneys doing the investigation, and then you have the, the judges making the decision. In Colombia, it was the same judge who did the whole process, and it was all written. Here, it's oral. 
you have people coming in, it's open. Our other system was closed. So you will see, and I will share with you, that this structural change, which has taken four years to put in place, because it took two years to pass, because if it's a constitutional change, it has to go through two different years of Congress, and has to go through the two houses, committee, plenary, committee, plenary of House and Senate, committee, plenary, committee, plenary in the, in the, the following year. And then for three years, we've been training attorney generals and we've been training judges because it's a completely different system. So the conviction rate has increased and we have also increased the number of inspectors. Here is where you can see how the homicide rate of union members has gone down. What is very sad in, in both of these cases is that we still have these numbers and as you will see, half of them are teachers because the teachers are an important part of our union membership. And teachers aren't being killed, being kill, uh, are not being killed because they're teachers. It's because they're out in these areas where there's still violence. They are, they are out there providing services. So we have put into place a program with our Ministry of Education. Any teacher who feels threatened is immediately transferred before doing any kind of study. That, and so we, this year we've transferred, I don't remember this, the data, but it's more than 1,000 teachers from one place to the other addressing this issue just as we have created a program for labor union members, but also for mayors and councilmen who are threatened, they can come and get protection. This is a program that went from $2 million to $42 million a year. Half of that money is going to labor union members. There are more than 2,000, 1,959 mem union members who are receiving protection. And what's interesting is that the labor unions are part of this program. They are the ones who help to analyze what kind of protection program is required. And so we hope to receive, in, in that way, to achieve two effects. One, that the labor unions will let their members know that this is an option that's out there. And secondly, that they will be there to allow us to make the best decision as to the kind of protection that the labor union members require. Here we start seeing what we made in, as a constitutional reform working on the judicial and so between, between 202 and 204, constitutional reform. 205, then what we started doing was preparing our judges and our attorney generals by different parts of the country. So we started first Bogotá, Manizales, Pereira, Menia, that's our coffee region. Then we went to Medellín, Bucaramanga, San Gil. These were sort of the second layer of big cities and their surrounding areas. The third, then we went out to, to smaller cities, which are further out. And since this year, we've had nationwide coverage. We are finding with data of, la of this year and a bit of last year, as this has gone to place, that the number of average days to indictment have gone down significantly. And we hope that this just shows the kind of trend that we're going to be seeing as this system moves along much better. But this is not a system that was changed. This is a system that we felt was absolutely necessary to make our justice work better. And this is an area where we have received very important support from the U.S. Your Department of Justice has helped us, has trained our uh, attorney generals, and we, that is very important in that vision that you and we have been sharing as to how Colombia has to improve. So here we also see that not only are we improving the convictions in general, but we are addressing the issue of human rights in particular. And the Attorney General's Office, which is totally independent, it's not like here in the States, it's part of the executive. Our Attorney General's Office is part of the judicial system. And so what uh, the government has done is doubled the amount of money that we've given the Attorney General's Office from the general um, budget. But for the uh, Human Rights Office, they've gotten, they've gotten an increase of 70%. So there's a subunit that has to do with a unit that has to do with human rights, and in there, there are subunits, one that has to do with peace and justice, one that has to do with extrajudicial killings, one that has to do with labor union members, and each one has uh, attorneys that have been defined to work on these cases to make sure that we move them ahead. And in the case of the labor cases, it is, there are 187 that have been prioritized. These were defined, the priority were defined with the labor unions. We, they had put complaints at the ILO uh, for 1,000 cases, some of which were threats, some of which were um, 
some were threats, some were homicides, and they said these were the 187 they wanted to see move through faster. If they've been moving along as, as of this year, they've, we've, uh, there have been 177 convictions, and this is moving along. Some of these cases are what are called cold cases, so it takes a while to get going, but we're moving. And we have been working very strongly with the ILO to, uh, oh, and, and the other thing that we've done is this year we're worried because the number of homicides has gone up in percentage ways compared to last year. Last year there were 27 homicides of labor union members. This, in the whole year that was 27, this year it's 27 as we speak today. Once again with that same uh, number, half being teachers, half being others, and uh, we don't quite understand what's happening here. The f initial investigations show that there are different kinds of reasons. Some have to do with delinquency, some have to do with violence in different regions. Others may have to do with issues related to their labor union uh, activity, but it's not one pattern. We're still finding that, that this has a manifestation of that violence that is taking place in the country. So the president, one, has in, uh, passed a new bill to increase prison penalties for homicide of trade union members. We're sending a very strong message. And there are also rewards paid for information which will allow us to move forward. And we've been working also on our labor rights. Colombia has uh, implemented, ratified the 60 ILO conventions. As we worked with the labor issues, we have started a cooperation program. And in that manner, we have decided um, we are working to address these issues with labor, with the employees, and with the government. So we are feeling very, very optimistic, but we're starting to find, and you know that procession always takes longer than the reality to catch up. And so I invite you to go to Colombia because that's the best way to catch up what's happened in these six years. But you are finding that The Economist, The Guardian, Business Week, are, have already started to register this change and this improvement. Inside Colombia, a changing landscape, we find articles also in the New York Times suggesting that it, it's very interesting to see what is happening in Medellin. Um, so visit Cartagena, which is beautiful, but also visit Medellin, visit the coffee region, visit Bogota. Uh, this was a study done by the CSIS where it said, back from the brink, and it shows the progress in Colombia. Business Week has identified us as one of the emerging markets. And I think what's also interested is, interesting is that we find that other um, leaders are also seeing Colombia's improvement, and they feel that it's important that we continue to work together as a region. And so the leaders of the region starting with President Bachelet and President Alan Garcia of Peru and President Torrijos, uh, most of the Central Americans, President Calderon, Prime Minister Harper, have all come out and written to Speaker Pelosi saying, let's complete this vision we have of the region. These are all countries that have trade ag agreements with the U.S. and they see the trade agreements as a way of creating a greater integration in the region and making sure that we are working in a more solid way towards the same kind of, um, of values. There have been more than 100, there had been more than 100 supportive editorials for the trade agreement before the rescue, after the rescue we've gotten 40 more which just show that th there's a feeling that this is a way to continue to help a country that is moving forward. The Democrats who live in Colombia have, one, written to their uh, members asking them to include, to consider the free trade agreement with Colombia. They see it as something that is important in their view as they live in Colombia. And they have asked that it be included, and I think was included in the 2008 platform of Democrats abroad. Here we have uh, Colombia, because it, like the U.S., we believe that open economy and trade are, is a good way to move forward. At this moment, we either have agreements with these countries or we are in the process. Just last week, we finished our negotiation with EFTA. We had finished the week before our negotiation with Canada. 
We have strengthened our negotiation with Chile, with Mexico, and so Colombia is moving ahead in this way, and we think that there's a very important piece there that needs to uh, be addressed, which is the U.S. Because why? The U.S. has been our most important trade partner. And although somebody was saying, but you're not a very important country for our economy, we're not the largest economy, but we have 40 million people. We're seeing how our GDP has doubled. We're seeing how the, you'll see, the agriculture is very complementary. So what we want to start is by leveling, leveling the playing field. You have given us preferences for 15 years. So if we're worried about the economy, whatever disruption there might have been, and I think it was minimum, that has been worked out through the system. And what we've done now is create jobs in Colombia and the, in the U.S. We've created more than 600,000 jobs in Colombia. We have probably created a similar number here because, for example, with flowers, for every flower grower that we have there, of the person who's cutting flowers, you create one and a half jobs here because it has to be sold and distributed. And we find with the mills in North Carolina, you're selling us the, the cotton we need for the apparel. So we've gotten this going. Let's le allow your products to come in and let's have this, have this, uh, these preferences, which are always temporary. And the, that part that it's temporary means we don't have the level of investment we want to have. Uh, we need to move. Make it cheaper and more competitive. Ours is a tropical economy. Yours is temperate. We buy wheat. We buy soy. We buy corn from the U.S. We are the largest uh, buyer of agricultural goods because our economies are, are um, complementary, the, the largest buyer in Latin America. U U.S. exporters have an edge over competition because we have had this alliance. We have worked together. We know each other. And we all know that trust is good for building. Um, and we want to keep a beneficial relationship growing. Trade has to do about trade, but it also has to do about other kinds of ties, other kinds of relationships. It has to do with trust. It has to do with stability. It has to do with making our countries and our relationships stronger. And so this is why I would invite you to continue to, uh, that we continue working together. We're finding that the free trade agreement, these are studies that were done, show that it would mean growth in Colombia. The IIE did studies here that shows it would mean growth for the U.S. But above all, we have been friends, and friends are here to help friends. And I think it's good for the U.S., it's good for Colombia, and I appreciate the time that you've given me this morning to listen to the Colombian story, which I hope you will have a chance to go down with Mickey Mouse and see for yourself that it's not a Mickey Mouse story. It's a real good story that has a lot of substance to it. And thank you very, very much.